Right. It's my pleasure today to welcome Bharat Markani to give the All Souls Seminar at home. Bharat is Senior Lecturer at Cardiff University. Uh, his research focuses on the intersection between human rights and criminal justice, with a particular focus on capital punishment, racism and wrongful convictions. Bharat is the author of the 2018 Routledge book, Slavery and the Death Penalty. And today he will be talking to us about the United Kingdom and the worldwide death penalty law, policy and practice. As is normal with the series these days, we will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, during his talk, it's probably best if most of us, uh, other than, than a few of us in the department, keep our videos off. Um, and then we will turn it over to questions for about half an hour. Um, when you ask a question, please uh, put your video on. Otherwise, also you can pose your question in the chat and Carol and I will be monitoring that and we, we can read your question out. So I'm gonna hand over to you now. Are you going to share your screen? I will do, thank you very much. Let me just bring that up. Is that showing now? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, and let me just get the... Um I go in and move that out of the way. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. Thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to discuss this project with everyone. Um, I will start by um, with some acknowledgements. I should say that this is part of a funded project. It's called Reforming British Law and Policy on the Global Death Penalty, funded by the British Academy. Um, and it's a project that is really looking at how British law and policy has shaped the global death penalty, both historically and today, contemporarily. Um, Lizzie Seal is the primary investigator at the University of Sussex, University of Sussex and my, our um, co-conspirators, if you like, are Lindsay Black, Florence, who's here today, Taylor Florence, and Roger Ball at the University of Sussex. So we're a mix of criminologists, historians, I come from law departments, and like I said, we're looking at um, how historically the UK has shaped and influenced death penalty law and practice and how we continue to um, shape death penalty law and practice today. So I'm very much looking at the latter aspect, contemporary relationship with the UK and the death penalty. And as a brief outline, a sort of basic outline of the talk today, there are really three elements to this talk. The first is to set out the orthodox view that the UK opposes the death penalty in all circumstances at all times and promotes abolition abroad. And that's not really controversial, and we'll see that that's fairly taken for granted. However, there are times where law, policy and practice don't always reflect that position. There are times when we are silent, when perhaps we could be more vocal about opposing the death penalty. And there are times when we actually facilitate um, executing people. And one part of this project is trying to get to grips with, um, with how prevalent that is. Are they aberrations? Um, and trying to get to grips with those sort of questions. And then the third aspect of this paper is trying to understand the extent to which this mismatch between rhetoric and practice um, can be explained with reference to the legacies of colonialism. So I very much came at this as um, with my law background, that's why I joined the project. And it was very much about, is there a legal prohibition on being complicit with the death penalty abroad? That's what my starting point was, and I've published a couple of pieces on that. But because my colleagues on this project are interested in the colonial aspect, the history of colonialism in conversations with them, I've come to sort of start to see linkages between today's complicity with the death penalty and historical legacies of colonialism. And so I'm going to try and sort of see if we can merge the two. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not completely convinced we can. That's part of the reason for giving this talk to sort of see whether the arguments I make are really have legs or not, but um, we'll come up to that point after I've set out the first two parts of this paper. Okay, so first of all, the orthodox view. UK opposed to death penalty. I don't think we need to labour this point. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of statements from the government um, setting out its opposition to the death penalty. This is just one from a statement made to the Human Rights Council um, February 2019. You can see there the UK's long-standing policy is to oppose the death penalty. The UK presses for the reduced use of the death penalty. And the third line there, we encourage incremental reform and progress towards global abolition. And we can see hundreds of those sort of statements in various forms in different statements. And that, um, that sort of policy initiative, that policy statement, plays out in policy initiatives. 
1998, Robin Cook, um, Foreign Secretary, set up the death penalty panel um, and concluded your own um, Roger Hood was part of that initial death penalty panel. And, um, and it was very much making opposition to death penalty, promotion of abolition abroad, a focal point, the centerpiece of foreign policy. That wasn't just limited to uh, Labour, the coalition government in 2010 developed that and developed the strategy for the abolition of the death penalty. It was quite unique at the time, it was one of the first of its kinds, and I think most people involved in anti-death penalty work would say it was, there was a lot to commend about it. It was very detailed, it was very well thought through, and it really set out a, a coherent strategy for trying to promote abolition. It wasn't without its flaws, of course, nothing ever is, but it was, it was very good stuff. Identified countries, identified methods by which to promote abolition, bilateral initiatives, multilateral initiatives. 2011, we see the development of the Overseas Security and Justice Assistance Guidance, um, saying that when we come to provide assistance in criminal justice matters abroad, we have to take into account whether that country uses a death penalty and make sure we're not inadvertently or deliberately complicit with it. And although the strategy wasn't renewed when it came to an end in 2015, it was subsumed under a broader human rights and democracy program. So since 2015, although there hasn't been this sort of statement strategy as such, it is still very much a part of, um, of our foreign policy. And those sort of policy initiatives play out in legal measures too. So we will not extradite a person um, if there is a risk that they will face a death penalty, unless we get an assurance that they won't be subject to capital. We won't provide mutual legal assistance under the OSJA guidance. There are actually legislation to prime overseas production orders act, um, data protection act, various agreements. And this is just, this is not a non-exhaustive list, but just to show that we do take these sort of things seriously. We do say that we will not engage in practices that might lead to an increase in the use of the death penalty. And there are various other ways outside of policy and law, there are various other ways in which we promote abolition abroad and which we try and reduce its use. So um, the government gives support to non-governmental organisations, the Death Penalty Project, Reprieve, Amicus, various others. And of course, there's the actual work of those um, organisations. Another aspect of this broader project has been to interview people who work with those organisations to get uh, sort of place for working practices, how their sort of neo-colonial aspect of their work, you know, that danger of a British organisation going out to another country saying you shouldn't do this. Um, that's a different aspect, but it just goes to show that we have not just the SEO, we also have civil society here engaged in anti-death penalty work. There's an all-party parliamentary group on the death penalty headed by Baron Stern, where um, they assist parliamentarians in other countries. They work independently of the government. But they work with parliamentarians in other countries um, to sort of assist them with promoting abolition. A work of UK-based academics. I'm very conscious I'm talking to, um, to Carolyn here and also members of the Death Penalty Research Unit. Um, I feel a bit of a fraud pretending I know something about the death penalty speaking to you all, but, um, but obviously, um, sorry Carolyn, I'm not going to go on about all the brilliant work you do, but we all know that UK-based academics such as yourself have done some fantastic work in, in promoting abolition abroad and reform abroad. And we also have the Privy Council, um, which is final cases from, um, from Commonwealth countries that, that still use the Privy Council as, um, as their final court. And decisions of the Privy Council have shaped the use of the death penalty, restricted the use of the death penalty um, in various places. And again, that's the subject, and there's lots of papers coming out of this. That's a, a whole different, different paper. However, despite all these sort of wonderful ways in which we promote abolition, we also know through research that there are various ways, various times when we, our practice hasn't always lived up to that promise. So this is again a non-exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea of the range of ways in which we don't always live up to that promise of promoting abolition. Um, about 10 years ago now, 2010, it came to light that UK companies were supplying the chemicals needed for lethal injections um, to the USA. I think there was also to Vietnam. Um, and there was that issue of you know, we're actually making executions possible in these countries. 
for many years, we have provided support for anti-drug tra trafficking initiatives. We give money, resources um, to the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. That's funneled out to countries such as Iran and Pakistan to supply of sniffer dogs, night vision goggles, all those sort of things to help catch drug traffickers. And then they're caught and executed. And we have maybe indirectly, maybe inadvertently, but there's a clear causal chain there where we have provided assistance. That assistance has led to the capture of someone who's then been executed. Um, another example from Sierra Leone, uh, if it gave funding to, to Sierra Leone to help them with a backlog of criminal cases, and that led to the imposition of some mandatory death sentences, clearly problematic. And then there have been several cases, I've listed some here from Antigua, Thailand, USA, Kenya, where despite that the overseas security and justice assistance guidance saying that we should not provide criminal justice assistance without getting assurances that the death penalty won't be imposed, there have been times when we have provided assistance even though we haven't obtained or secured a no death penalty assurance. So we've helped uh, police investigate crimes in other countries. That's led to a suspect being arrested, sentenced to death as a result of our assistance, or at least partly as a result of our assistance. So we've been complicit. We've facilitated an execution abroad or a death sentence abroad. So that sort of gives you an idea of the, the multiple ways in which we might or have been and which we might be inadvertently complicit in the death penalty abroad. And I think the important thing to notice here is that these aren't sort of instances where something has just spawned through the net and someone says, whoops, sorry, we'll fix that. Because when those issues have been raised, the government's generally fought back. In a lot of these cases, these are just three cases where the government fought back um, against claims that we shouldn't be doing these things. They might not have won um, the final analysis and ultimately public pressure campaigning has um, resulted in a change of policy. Um, but the point is, is that it's been a struggle. Despite the, the rhetoric going on behind the scenes, it's still been a struggle. So that brings us to the third and what I hope would be the, um, the more interesting part of this paper, um, which is trying to understand, trying to explain, trying to understand the divide between this rhetoric and practice. Is it just politics? The USA, and we'll talk about this case in a little bit, so I won't labor it here, but there have been cases where we haven't wanted to upset the Trump administration. That's the, um, the USA case, which we'll talk about in a bit. Is it just politics, other factors, other values come into play that trump our opposition to the death penalty in, in a particular circumstances? Individual errors and free machinery of government, I think these probably go hand in hand. The government is a big organization, lots of different departments, lots of people, and sometimes a person, a department will just make an honest mistake. They won't realize that they're supposed to have sought an assurance before providing assistance. That was certainly the case in Thailand. The National Crime Agency gave assistance, and when they realized that they hadn't sought assurances, they were very quick, in fairness to them, to say that was our mistake. Um, Sierra Leone, creaky machinery of government, with that issue where we had provided assistance to clear a backlog of cases, discussions about the death penalty had taken place. But an assurances were received that there's a moratorium in Sierra Leone. So even though death sentences will be handed down, these people won't be executed. And so things went ahead. But of course, it only comes to light later that actually we shouldn't be engaged in the handing down of death sentences either. If we're really serious about promoting abolition, it isn't just about reducing executions, it's about reducing the number of death sentences too. And so actually we should have pushed further on that Sierra Leone case. We shouldn't really have given assistance until we had an assurance that those people would not be sentenced to a mandatory death sentence, moratorium or not. And then sometimes it's just the personal beliefs of those in government, but also high commissioners, ambassadors, the extent to which they take the death penalty seriously. Um, foreign, um, Robin Cook was obviously very much anti-death penalty and so was very proactive. Um, but clearly some people in government are not so anti-death penalty. Um, we have our Home Secretary who has gone on record saying she supports the death penalty, so that would explain um, instances of complicity perhaps, or a failure to be as robust in our opposition as we would expect. But I want to explore uh, not an alternative explanation, I think this explanation might encompass those 
those are the right explanations. And this is where I'm still a little bit unsure of where I'm going with this, so, um, but we'll see how it works out. And I've titled it Post-Colonialism and the Legacy of Empire. And what I mean by that is, to what extent is the UK's contemporary relationship with the death penalty worldwide shaped by the role of the death penalty in the age of empire? To what extent can our current relationship with the death penalty be explained in reference to the historical ways in which we engage with the death penalty? So, to sort of row back a little bit, I think, um, not row back, but just to sort of broaden the, the analysis a bit, it's fairly straightforward to say that in the era of empire, we shape the use of the death penalty in the colonies. And there's been a lot of research on that, and my colleagues on this project are doing more research on that, the ways in which the legal processes, execution methods in the likes of India, Caribbean countries, various African countries, former colonies, were shaped by us as an imperial power. It always feels weird to talk about us when I'm talking about Britain as an imperial power, um, but, uh, but I'll go ahead with that anyway. But what's less understood, but is emerging in the literature, is the ways in which the institutions, social structures, mindsets, ideologies of the UK have itself been shaped by the history of empire. So um, the ways in which we understand our role in the world, how has that been shaped by our history of empire? I live in Bristol and um, we had the whole issue with the Edward Colston statue over summer that I'm sure most many of you know about and sort of reckoning with our own memory of empire and our involvement in slave trade, for example. And it was, it was incredible to see just how deeply embedded Colston was as a hero in this city. You know, schools named after him, Yes, named after him and so on. Um, and that affects our ideologies, our mindsets, our understanding of, of the history of empire. And so there's a quote there by, by Darwin, Britain itself is constituted by empire. And if we take that as our starting point, trying to understand the way in which our contemporary mindsets and ideologies are shaped by the history of empire, then that sort of changes the question. Could we argue that our approach, our political, legal approach to the death penalty worldwide is also perhaps shaped by the history of the death penalty in the colonies and the way we understand the role of the death penalty in the colonies, in former colonies. If we take that as our starting point, then the question becomes, what was the role of the death penalty in empire? And there are various sources we can turn to from this. Um, like I said, there's a uh, a lot of academic literature on this. These are just some examples. Um, a lot of work on, on the death penalty in empire, and I'm going to try and sum up a very complex relationship um, in sort of five minutes or so. So I'm just picking out the most salient points for the purposes of this project. There is a lot more to say about this. But some of the most so, sort of um, relevant points that come out of the work of, um, of David Anderson, Stacey Hine, Claire Anderson, and various others is this idea that we have to ensure that we don't talk about the death penalty in the age of empires being this sort of monolithic practice. The death penalty varied from various colonies depending on local cultures, local religions, execution methods would vary depending on local religions, local cultures, local beliefs. I think Claire Anderson makes this really useful point that judicial killing was mutually constituted in the sense that it wasn't just a case that we exported the death penalty to other colonies, to the colonies that introduced them there their practices, their beliefs shaped and influenced our understanding of the death penalty in the metropole too. So our approaches to judicial killing were, were mutually constituted, it wasn't one-way traffic. And also um, it's important to recognise, and this comes really out of histories of the hanged about the Mau Mau camp, the rebellions, uh, sorry, the, um, the acts of empire in Kenya and um, and the use of the death penalty as a result of rebellions in Kenya, so-called rebellions. And this idea that the death penalty in the colonies was really generally focused on social control, on, on controlling indigenous people, and controlling the colonized in ways that it wasn't used in the metropole. In the UK at the time, death penalty was very much just used for retribution and deterrence, the classic justifications for the death penalty. But in the colonies, it was used for different purposes as a way as a deterrent measure, but really as a way of exerting colonial control over the population. 
So I think it's always interesting in the 1950s, there's a general belief, isn't there, that the UK and, and the death penalty in the UK was in decline in the 1950s, the results of Timothy Evans and um, Derek Bentley and those sort of cases that generated public opposition to the death penalty, there were relatively few executions. But actually in Kenya at the time, under British colonial rule, there were thousands. It's, um, and that often goes, goes unnoticed. There were thousands because it was used as a tool of social control, not because all those people deserved a death penalty in inverted commas. We can also look to literature. Um, short stories by Kafka, Orwath, Penal Colley and a Hanging, who, who are really interesting short stories that really highlight the contradiction between colonial rule as a civilizing mission on the one hand, yet the barbarity that the death penalty revealed when it was actually imposed. Colonial rule was justified as a civilizing mission and we're here to help these, um, the natives, yet then we'd impose the death penalty in quite barbaric ways. Um, and, and those two short stories, I think, really do a good job of highlighting that. And then there are um, broader philosophies or theories of post-colonialism that, um, that I think are interesting. So have this idea of necropolitics, a Chilean Bembe talks about this idea of how imperial powers deployed policies that were designed to bring about death, designed to make death more likely. And so he talked about these technologies of death that were utilized by imperial powers. Um, and related to that, he, from that, he sort of developed this idea of sovereignty being the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not. So when you bring those sort of things together, you realize that the colony is the site where the sovereign power really exercised that power to define who is disposable and who isn't. And we can see how the use of the death penalty fits into that analysis. It was really our sovereign power's way of saying we have the power to decide who is disposable and who is not. And related to all of that was the state, the idea of state of exception. Um, again, using the example of Kenya, state of emergency, because in inverted commas, the natives are getting restless and we need to restore order. So we'll expand the scope of the death penalty, but only as an exceptional measure under the state of emergency. But post-colonial scholars are very clear, very good at pointing out that it's a bit impossible really to talk about the state of exception, state of emergency as an exception to the general rule because empire was founded on extra legal measures. It was founded on violence and fraud. So these legal rules never had a legal basis to begin with. And the state of exception was more the entire basis of um, empire was based on a state of exception, an exception to normal rules that prohibit violence and fraud and so on. So there's sort of a permanent state of exception. Empire existed in a permanent state of exception. Okay, so let's try and sort of tie those things together then. And I'm gonna use a recent case of El Ghazuli to try and sort of explore whether those sort of theories, those understandings of the death penalty colonialism and whether they have any relevance to contemporary relationship with the death penalty. El Ghazuli, some of you might be familiar with this because it um, generated a lot of headlines over the last couple of years. And um, the issue here was two Islamic State terrorists, British connections are captured, um, northern Syria, I think it was. And to cut a long story short, we have a letter from our Home Secretary at the time, Sajid Javid, saying to the US Attorney General at the time, Jeff Sessions, we will help you prosecute these people. We will hand over all the evidence we have on these two men. And we don't mind, and he says explicitly, we do not mind if you impose a death penalty on them. This isn't even a case of us being quiet about it or not seeking an assurance or failing to seek an assurance. It's an explicit statement. We give you express permission to go ahead and impose a death sentence on these people with our help. Okay, so naturally this is challenged in court. Um, and the question before the court was, is it unlawful for the Secretary of State to exercise his power to provide mutual legal assistance so as to provide evidence to a foreign state that will facilitate the imposition of the death penalty? In other words, more succinctly, is it unlawful for us as a country to, be, to facilitate the use of the death penalty abroad? And the court held that, um, no, it's not. There is no general common law duty to prohibit facilitation of the death penalty. There is a statutory duty, 
it's contrary to part three of the Data Protection Act. But the interesting thing there for us was, um, was that the court decided there's no general common law duty prohibiting facilitation of the death penalty. This becomes interesting when we look at the reasoning of the various judges. So Lord Kerr dissenting argues that it is unlawful at common law. He takes the view that the state cannot facilitate the execution of the death, death penalty against anyone anywhere in the world, anyone within the UK's jurisdiction. He does allow for an exception to that. He does say there are some circumstances where the common law principle should yield. Um, and that is when the provision of intelligence is necessary, absolutely necessary as a matter of urgency to save lives. So general rule that there is a prohibition but there can be exceptions to that. What I think is interesting are these statements, uh, the judgments rather, by Lord Conrad and Lord Reid. Um, and the majority say that there is no common law prohibition, primarily because they cannot find laws and practices to give that sort of historical context. I mean, my argument to that would be there's no practice on this point because we've never really been involved in expressly saying to another country go ahead and execute these people with our assistance but anyway um, the majority say that there is no general common law prohibition but they can't help throwing in this little paragraph saying not to even disregard the issue of whether there's practice on this point or not he says it is not difficult to envisage circumstances where urgent exchange of information um, will might be required relating to an immediate threat to public security. That should not be inhibited by concerns that it might ultimately lead to a risk of the death penalty. So in other words, what Lord Conrad seems to be saying there is flipping around Lord Kerr's analysis. Lord Kerr was saying general prohibition, but there can be exceptions. Whereas Lord Conrad is saying that because of the need for exceptions, we can't have a general rule. In other words, he's saying that the state of exception governs our approach to this. And Lord Reid grapples with this argument that of course there's a prohibition on this because we have so many statements, so many policy statements to the effect that we will not be complicit in the death penalty abroad. So many policy statements saying we oppose the death penalty and we promote abolition. And he goes through this and says, well, actually the government's policy in this area is more nuanced than that. Right, so what do these two statements, and there are a few others, but again, just for the purposes of a, of a half hour talk, I'm focusing on just a couple of the statements. How do we tie that back to what I was saying about our sort of post-colonial understandings of the death penalty, if you like? Well, I started to sort of try and map what I've said about the death penalty in the colonial era and post-colonial understandings, necropolitics and so on, on the one side, and then our contemporary approach to the death penalty. Um, on the other side of this table. And we can see that, you know, the way in which we exported the death penalty to different places and implemented the death penalty in places differed from place to place. We, it was variable. And likewise, our opposition to the death penalty today seems to be variable. It will depend on our relationship with the country in question. In El Ghazuli, there was very much the belief that we needed to keep the Trump administration happy. So we kind of tweaked our opposition to the death penalty according to, to that place. Africa, someone pointed out the contradiction between the civilizing mission of empire with the brutality of the death penalty. And we have this contradiction between absolute opposition on paper to the death penalty with, again, the sort of variable approach to facilitating the death penalty abroad. I mentioned earlier that thing about how the state of emergency or state of exception governed colonial rule. Lord Conwood's decision in El Ghazuli seems to suggest that this state of exception needs to govern our approach to the relationship with the death penalty abroad. We always have to be aware of this need to, to have an exception. I've talked about Claire Anderson's understanding of death penalty practices being mutually constituted between the metropolitan and colonies. And actually our approach to abolition abroad today is mutually constituted. The way in which we approach abolition in other countries depends and varies according to what is fed back from that country. Um, another quote from Claire Anderson in, um, in that book chapter that I cited earlier, colonial practices were inflected with the politics of imperial power. The idea that colonial approaches to judicial killing were shaped by the politics of imperialism 
Well, our approach to abolition today is affected by politics of imperialism still, the idea of neo-colonialism. And again, this sort of idea of we have to be very careful when we go to other countries and say you should abolish the death penalty because we just get charged with accusations of neo-colonialism. But we also see that abolitionism inflect, is inflected by other politics, political considerations, trade. They need to keep a particular government on side, for example. And ultimately, it all boils down to, I think, this, this quote from Julian Bembe about the power to define who is disposable and who is not. And our approach to the death penalty worldwide seems to still hinge on that approach. You know, we have exceptions to the non-facilitation principle, which gives us the power to define who is disposable and who is not in any given case. There are some times when we would say, no, your life is not as important as our political considerations in this particular case. Okay, I will um, I'll wrap up there, partly because I've gone way over my 30 minutes, I think, but also um, because that is really where I've got to with this analysis so far. So, um, so you can sort of see, I think my main question, my main issue is, am I trying to draw connections that aren't there? Are these just coincidences? Or is there something, something to draw from our history of colonialism in order to understand our contemporary approach to the death penalty worldwide? So, um, so... Thank you for listening. I will open it up to questions now. Yeah.